Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We appreciate you coming out tonight. Uh, this is the third of the uh, webinar series put on by the New Jersey Turf Grass Association. My name is Mike Reed. Um, I, I'm glad you're here. Matt Lindner, who is our vice president of the New Jersey Turf Grass Association, um, he's going to be your host for tonight's session. Say hello to everyone, Matt. Good evening and welcome. Thank you for attending. <laughs> hey, first and foremost, Matt, I think the most important thing we need to do is we need to thank our sponsors because truthfully, without their assistance, we wouldn't be able to do this. It's through their generosity, their support that we were able to provide this free webinar, not only to NJTA members, but also people who were not members. We wanted to make sure we extended it out to everybody. Um, we should be down in Atlantic City right now. We're not. And so we're kind of sad. So later on, maybe uh, we can hoist up a drink for one another and, and salute the NJTA. Guys, we have to mute all phones during the webinar. The reason we have to do that is we don't want to have background noise that may interrupt the rest of the group. So if you're coming on late and I don't have a chance to mute you, please do me a favor, mute your phone for me. Now, we are going to have questions and answers at the end of the seminar. We don't want to kind of break up the continuity of the seminar by asking questions as the presenter is going on. So the way you're going to ask questions is we have a chat box. And in that chat box, that's where you can type in your questions. And at the end of the evening, when we're done with the presentation, we'll read each question that's in the chat box and we'll read it back to Carl and he will be able to answer those questions for you. Now, in order to be compliant with the DEP, we need to have quizzes built into the presentation. That's not going to be a pass or fail, but it is going to be a way for us to show that you were paying attention during the class by responding to the quizzes. So again, it's not pass or fail. And each time we launch a quiz, you're going to have a minute and 30 seconds to complete that quiz. Now, last night's presentation, we did have some trouble with some people who couldn't view the quiz. We launched it, and I think it was like 85% of the people saw the quiz, and there was 15% that somehow it didn't show up on their side of the screen. If it doesn't show up on your side of the screen, do me a favor, send me a chat saying, hey, I can't see the quiz. Um, we're working on resolving that issue, but at least then I have a chat log that I can show the state. Hey, he tried to take the quiz. He could not see. He or she could not see it. Now, it's important. In order to receive CEUs or continuing education credits, you must take a picture of yourself holding your driver's license and email it to executdirector at njturfgrass.org. Please do that. Take a picture of that. And I just noticed a mistake in my slide. I'd say subject 129 turf class. What's today's date? Isn't it tenth. the 10th? Let's just well, change it to the 10th. That's a little snaffle on my part. Right now, if you've got your camera or your phone out, take a picture of this slide so you know where to send a picture of you holding your license. Now, tonight, we're going to be giving away credits. Uh, it's going to be two 3A credits, two New Jersey 3B credits, two 6B credits, and those are hard to find two category 10 and two category 13. And for our friends in Pennsylvania, this class got two four credits. So we got a lot of credits. So Kevin McPeak said pesticide license, not driver's license. Nope, it actually has to be your driver's license. And the reason it has to be your driver's license, it has a picture on it. And so that's how that that's what the state wants. So that's what we need to do. They will not accept the picture of you holding your pesticide license. With that said, I'm going to turn this over. Well, actually, before I turn it over, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about who's going to be speaking tonight. We're going to be talking with Carl Cemente, who's an extension aid and program manager for, for the Turf Grass Science and Research Unit at Cornell University. Um, he's going to be talking about EIQ, or environmental impact quote. And he's going to explain it to you and, and give it to you in a term so you can understand it and see how you can find a way to fit it into your current lawn care program. Now, now, Carl, not only 
went to the university and, and got a bachelor's degree. He also then went out and did some pro golfing for a while. How'd that work out for you, Carl? You were pro golfer for how many years? Well, well, let's put it this way. I'm not a pro golfer anymore. <laughs> ah, so, I, you know, I spent a couple of years doing that and you learn very quickly that there are guys out there who you will never hear of who will shoot 62 every single round. However, Mike, <laughs> we also learned in the discussion today with Carl that his wife is a pro golfer. So um, if anyone um, wants to go to Cornell and, and, and learn how to play golf, I'm sure we have some in uh, there. So we're talking to the wrong Cemente is what you're saying. Yeah, I think so. I think oh, uh, yeah. you're missing the better half. <laughs> <laughs> so, Carl, I just flipped over control to you. Oh, seamless. Nicely done. Carl, you, take you can see everything? Perfect. Yeah, we're good. Perfect. We're good to go, well, Carl. Well, uh, first of all, uh, thanks, Mike and, and Matt, for the introduction. Um, I'm glad you didn't have me hold up my driver's license because I still have one from when I was 16 when I had braces. Um, <laughs> Mike and I recognize me. Um, but anyway, uh, you know, thanks for the introduction and, and excited to talk about a topic um, that really was the first thing I started uh, with when I when I came here to Cornell a couple of years ago. Started working with uh, Dr. Frank Rossi of the Cornell Turf, Turf Grass Program, who some people may or may not know. Uh, and then Jennifer Grant, who recently retired from the New York State IPM office. You may have heard her talk about this last year in the New Jersey conference. Um, but we're going to talk about the environmental impact quotient. Um, and so this was actually a model developed at Cornell by uh, Joe Kovac and a couple of his colleagues in the early 90s. And the title of the paper pretty much says all you need to, need to know, really. Method to measure the environmental impact of pesticides. Um, so today I just want to go over a couple things. First of all, you know, why should we care about pesticide use on turf? I think all of us have an idea, but I just want to set the tone for kind of why this is an important thing um, to keep track of. Uh, and then we, we're going to talk about how do you measure pesticide risk. So if I get my little pen out here, there's, there's a difference between the term pesticide use and pesticide risk. And we're going to talk about why those are different and how we measure risk as opposed to something like pesticide use. Um, and of course, that's going to lead us to the EIQ, this thing that allows us to measure pesticide risk. And then we're going to talk about practical examples, how this is something you guys can do, uh, not kind of this theory in the clouds thing um, that, that many people, I think, initially think of. So first of all, perception, right? I, I just went on Twitter. You know, I'm, I'm a young guy. I have social media. I typed in pesticide use in grass. And uh, unsurprisingly, there's some pretty... Um, you know, interesting opinions out there on Twitter and public perception a lot of times uh, can't take into account the, the gray areas, the, the detail-oriented aspects of a, of a topic, let alone pesticide use on turf grass. Um, so, of course, a lot of these are, you know, a little bit ridiculous. Got cancer holding a golf ball in his mouth from the pesticides, stuff like that. Um, but it's hard for the public to grasp pesticide use and, and that it can be done reasonably. Um, and then if you look at... Uh, you know, the legalities of things and how we ban or restrict pesticides. Um, in some cases, uh, you know, legislators are making decisions with some good data that they're looking at. In some cases, it's it's maybe not good data and they're, they're acting on um, maybe some wills of, of people who might not have all the, all the data available. So again, this perception, this public perception, I think is, is, is gaining steam, and I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing if we can handle it properly, and, and that's where I think the EIQ comes in. Um, but it's important to note that it's, it's uh, I think there's some movement um, out there against pesticides, and it's important for us as a turf grass industry to be prepared for that, and I think the EIQ helps us, is going to help us do that. Um, so, and then just a, a very cluttered slide here of academic research. That's the reality of pesticide use, and it's it's complicated. It's it's not black and white. Um, there are things we have to worry about. You know, some some of the things on the left are papers that deal with um, looking at pesticide use and how that changes maybe the soil microbial community, which we don't know a whole lot about anyway. But we do measure some changes based on some of the pesticide products we use, uh, pesticides hanging around in the system, whether they um, can have implications for human exposure. Right, some pesticides found in water. And then, you know, on the other hand, there's research that says, uh, you know, pretty, pretty straightforward here. Pesticide dissipation is considerably faster in well-established turf. So what does that say? When we have a healthy turf grass system, those pesticides are going to be metabolized. They're going to be used. They're not going to 
leach out of that system as opposed to bare soil, right? So in that case, uh, turf is a good thing. Uh, this study looked at, at over 30,000 data points, um, two decades of water quality monitoring on golf courses. They only found in groundwater sites, less than 0.2% of samples were above kind of pesticide thresholds, less than about a half a percent um, of surface water quality samples were, were above those levels. So that's pretty good. We're doing pretty good there. Uh, and then a recent report, uh, Cornell report on neonic use, uh, New York State, again, 300 pages in this thing. Um, but in their executive summary, I think this underscores kind of, you know, how this is a, a tricky issue and not black and white. Neonics can, but do not always result in risk to bees. Right, and that's not saying they're always killing bees. It's not saying they're never killing bees. They're somewhere in between. And how we get to that in between is, is a hard thing to do, um, but that's where I think we can use things like models. So this is a, a bunch of different models here that estimate pesticide risk. So these are just, a, this is from a paper that looked at a bunch of different models and they all give you a number, right? And that single number tries to encapsulate certain aspects of risk when you use a pesticide. So I just highlighted some, some maybe common uh, active ingredients that we use in the turf industry. And you can see if you go across the models, um, Based on the model you're looking at, you might get a different conclusion, right? So for a phalanel, very high um, in this environmental yardstick. If you compare it to MYMCPA, it's a lot higher. But then if you look at, um, you know, this model, EPRIP, there's a ton of acronyms going around here. But OK, in this model, MCPA is a weighted is, is higher. So we consider it high risk in that model. And the reason is because all these models consider different things. And so. The ones we use at Cornell, the EIQ and its derivative field use EIQ, we'll talk about what the difference is there. Um, we think these these are kind of the simplest way to use it. They're the most accessible, and they include a and they include a bunch of information. Um, so why why the EIQ? Out of all these, there's I mean, if you go back to the slide. There's 50 other models like these. So why is the EIQ the one we like to use? Well, first of all, it's a single number. Um, a lot of the other models that weren't included on that slide, they can produce four or five different numbers and they mean different things that can be difficult. We like that it gets down to a single number that, that practitioners can use and make a decision on, right? Higher is worse, lower is better. Um, it, concludes, it includes a bunch of different data. So that's one thing we'll talk about later, but um, it's looking at toxicity to birds, bees, fish, um, soil arthropods. It's looking at a bunch of different target organisms, some of those other models are, can be one dimensional. Some care only about, for example, aquatic organisms and if it's going to get into the water. So we like that the EIQ is, is a little bit more uh, diverse in, in the organism that's looking, looking at and considering. Uh, easy website user interface. Again, we, we, this is a practical model, something people can actually use and make decisions on. It's not this theoretical thing that's buried in a paper. Uh, that you have to pay $30 to get if you're not a member of the journal, right? So it's it's accessible. And then finally, the, the database um, that calculate, that keeps all the, the relevant EIQ numbers is maintained by the New York State IPM program. Um, and so they do a good job of, of trying to update that as much as they can so that we don't have to go in there and, and calculate a big number. Um, so I think that brings us to our first quiz, Mike, um, making sure everybody's sticking with us here. If you want to, uh, I think Mike, what's Mike's. Okay, we're going to launch the first quiz, guys. So uh, cross your fingers that I don't screw this up. We've got <laughs> one minute and 30 seconds. Go get them. So a minute and 30 seconds. There we go. And like you said, Mike, this is not a uh, this is not a pass fail, right? This is just to make sure everybody's uh, paying attention. Hopefully, if you're paying attention, you'll get it right. But um, I'm just making sure everybody's still there. Do 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 do. Yeah, we need the Jeopardy. We we got 86 submitted so far. 86 percent. This is a pretty smart group. Yeah, we're doing pretty good. So is EIQ the only oh, model? Adam to... Blood, he's only got a blank white screen. Sorry, Adam. Adam, are you working with a uh, an Apple computer system by any chance? 
<laughs> well, you know what? We're going to close it up because I think as many people can answer is going to answer. We're at 86%. So let's close this up and review the answers, guys. So, uh, wow, actually pretty good. Average score of this was 97%. So good. to all. Yep. That's very good. Yeah. Very good. I'm quite impressed. I mean, I'm doing my job. <laughs> Hopefully. Um, so we're, we're good to go, Mike, here? Yeah, good go. All right. So um, now I want to get into how we actually calculate the EIQ. So just saying there's a bunch of these different models. The EIQ is the one we like to use at Cornell. And that's actually probably the most frequently used one uh, just because it's it's easy to use you know, calculating pesticide risk. And so earlier I said, there's a difference between pesticide use and pesticide risk. So pesticide use might be something like the number of applications you make or, or the pounds of active ingredients. So I know the New York DEC, they like to have a calculation every year of, of total pounds of active ingredient used um, on their various systems that they keep track of. And, and that's one way to track pesticides. Um, but a different way and kind of a more complicated way is, is to calculate pesticide risk. And that's a function of these two things, toxicity and exposure, right? So when you just say I have pounds of active ingredient, I use 20 a year. Well, what does that mean? Were, were those pounds of a, of a pesticide that was maybe really toxic or not as toxic? Um, and so the metaphor here is, is let's say I've got a, a glass, maybe I got a gin and tonic and I've got a glass of, of let's say, battery acid. Right, one of those things is a lot worse for me. One of those things is a lot more toxic. That's the battery acid. Um, but then, if you think of exposure, you know, how many times in my life am I going to have a cup of battery acid sitting next to me that I have to drink? Probably zero, right? Hopefully zero, unless I get in this three, some shady stuff three, there. Three <laughs> um, but there's going to be quite a few times where I've got a gin and tonic maybe sitting in front of me, and and if I drink a bunch of gin and tonics, maybe too many that's you've got some toxicity there and you've got the exposure right so the risk probably of that gin and tonic over the course of my lifetime is, is going to be greater than battery acid somewhere right so so those are that's kind of the metaphor hopefully that that people can relate back to toxicity and exposure so risk is a function of those two things so now the eiq equation and i'm not we're not we're not going to quiz you on the equation right this is bringing a lot of people back to probably algebra. There's, there's letters instead of numbers, what's going on here. Um, I wanna focus in on, on again, these, these two components of risk. So toxicity, we've got a bunch, bunch of different terms in here that uh, measure toxicity to certain things. So dermal and chronic are kind of mammalian tests. We usually do those on rats. So those are a proxy for toxicity to mammals. We've got fish, birds, bees, or arthropods, a bunch of different things in here. So we're considering the risk to a bunch of different organisms. And we're also going to consider the risk that this compound gets to those organisms. So is it going to run off? Is it going to get into the groundwater? How long is it in the soil? Is it persistent? Is it going to stick around a long time to where an organism might come along and might rub off on it? Um, so those are the kinds of things that are included in this model, toxicity and exposure elements. Uh, so a good, a good kind of term to look at in this equation is this one. Um, this encapsulates it pretty well. We've got F, that's toxicity to fish. And so all of these terms, there's raw data out there, and they basically get turned into a one, three, or a five. Five being bad, one being not so bad. So let's say something's really toxic to fish. Let's say it's a five. And then we go and look at the surface loss potential, runoff potential. And let's say this, this compound runs off very readily, right? It's gonna, if there's any rain, it might check off. So we're gonna get a term of 25 or five times five. Um, so, okay, that makes sense. It's stopping the fish. It's gonna get to the fish. It's gonna get to the water. It's bad, but what happens if we've got that compound and it's actually not going to be uh, readily ran off and it's not gonna get into the water supply? Um, we would give R actually a one, and so that's a lot lower term. So this is basically how it works, right? We're gonna balance, is it toxic to, is it gonna get to that organism? Um, so we get rid of this so, really so, quick. So Carl, going back, the lower the number, the better. The lower the number, the better. Yeah, hopefully, that's that's a good point. <laughs> that's just the lower the, the number, the better. 
Yeah. And, and that's and how Carl, that's... Your, Carl, your exposure uh, has little to do with applicator. Uh, it so there actually that's a good question, Matt. Um, there is some part of of exposure that goes into applicator. So there's actually three terms in here, and and the way in the paper is defined is farm worker, consumer, and ecological. For our case, farm worker is applicator. So if you okay. look at all the stuff that's underlined under applicator, you will see, first of all, DT dermal. That means if it gets on your skin. So right. we're considering, hey, you guys are handling the pesticides. It might get on your skin. That's that's a risk to you guys. And then also P, uh, plant surface half life. So if it's on the surface of, of the turf and you're walking, if you're applying via spreader or something or hand sprayer, we're considering that too. Um, so there's a component in here that measures risk to an applicator, and that's good. You want your your uh, your employees who are out there applying pesticides, you want you want this to kind of include them. Uh, the consumer aspect. Um, so we're going to think of that as the homeowner in this case. They're going to people be people who are on the lawn after you apply, maybe the dogs, the kids, whoever it is. So they're going to be walking around. We've got some things in here um, that measure both the toxicity of that and also the pesticides hanging around again for them. And then finally, the, the last component. Um, Kind of the environmental component that's all the birds bees soil arthropods all that stuff so you've got three components in here toxicity to all of them you basically average all those three divided by three and you get a number and as as mike said it's it's simple the higher the number the worse it is the lower the number the better it is so i just with, made up with, a, with, with, the, yeah. with the calculator that you're going to share with us later on it's going to do the math for us right Yep, and so that's that's a good point. Exactly. You know, again, we don't need to we don't need to go memorizing this thing. It's just for you guys to have an understanding of, of what goes into this model. So when you see this number, you know it considers all these different things A, B, and C. Um, so let's say I've got you know some fake fabricatazine and pretend zone here, and let's say we put all this data in there. It spits out a number of 15 for this guy and 30 for this guy. Um, so that's good. It means that if I've got a handful of fabricatazine that's uh, lower or, or less risk than a handful of pretendazone. Uh, but as we know, right, products, there's different rates, there's different percentages of active ingredient formulations. Um, you know, it's great that if I have a handful of this and handful of that, I can compare it, but what happens if I'm applying, applying this product at X rate and this product at Y rate, how do I account for that? Um, and this is a, a good example, so if we take our you know, fake products here. I've got this one, 40% active ingredient, four pounds per acre. And this one's a little bit less, right, active ingredient and also a lower um, rate. Again, we're thinking about the exposure here, right? So we've got the toxicity components built into that EIQ. We've even got some exposure components built into that EIQ number. And then the last thing we got to think of is, okay, how much is out there in the environment? How much are, are we putting out there? And that's when we use this field use EIQ or FU EIQ. If you want to focus there on the FU, it's it's a really <laughs> easy thing to remember. And this is how we That's kind Cornell, of Mike. um yep, yep, we keep it classy here in the Ivy League. <laughs> 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 FU EIQ. Uh, <laughs> so this this is this is the metric you're really gonna want to pay attention to. That's why FU pay attention. Um, so we've got that EIQ number and then we're going to account for the amount of active ingredient in the pesticide product and the application rate. This is, uh, we're gonna always convert to pounds per acre, but as we'll see on our EIQ calculator online, you can put in any rate, it'll calculate that in pounds per acre and spit it out for you so you don't have to worry about that. But this is how we account for the application rate, the exposure element of the pesticide when it's applied as a product. So if we take our example, we've got fabricatazine here, 40% active ingredient, four pounds per acre, that spits out a number of 24. Then we go to pretendazone. Okay, remember this is a higher EIQ. So apples to apples, this is, a, this is a, a, a more risky product. But once we consider the application rate, the exposure of it out when we're using it, this ends up being a softer, we call it a softer product. You can say lower risk product. Um, so that's how we start accounting for the rate. Just to, to have a ballpark of some of these numbers, I would say, um, based on all the data I've looked at, 25 or less is a low field use EIQ. 
once you start getting into the 50 range, okay, that's getting to medium, medium high. And then anything over 100, we're going to consider high risk. Um, so those are the ballpark numbers you can keep in mind if you, if you start using this EIQ calculator after today and we learn how to use it. Um, that's kind of the range, I think, to, to pay attention to. But in general, if you've got products that are 30 or 20, um, and if you can find products less than that, that's still good, right? You still want to strive for a lower number, lower risk. So, so um, having that uh, barometer can, can be good for people, but I think it's always important to see if you can find lower risk products. Yeah. So what you're saying is we don't look at it, its EIQ value. You have to look at all of those features or functions in order to come up with exactly how it's going to affect because you can have something that's got a high number looks bad to begin with but the use rate is so much lower that its field eiq score or fu score is going to be lower exactly exactly we always got to consider that amount that's out there because because that matters a lot yep um, all right so folks we are going to be launching the second quiz so at least 86 percent of you should be able to see this <laughs> you got a minute and 30 seconds, but I think you can get it done in a minute. This is a reading one. You gotta gotta make sure you you read all the things there. Oh, so you know, it's funny, Mike. The key word is what is not included. Yep. Yep. Mike, so you're not one. supposed to help them with the test. So <laughs> not included. I think I think Matt, we already talked about it. I'm a paste eater from way back in school. I need all the help I can get. Uh, you know, it's it's tough coming up with uh, quiz questions because I remember as a quiz as a recent quiz taker myself, I hate questions that have the word "not" in the question, and then the answer is the thing that it shouldn't be, right? But it, it is hard to come up with questions that <laughs> that aren't like that. <laughs> yeah. we, we are waiting for one more person to respond, and then I will, oh, we got that person. So we're going to close down the quiz, and let's do a quick review. Let's see, average score, 88%. So we're still passing, but some people didn't get it right. So the question asked was, which of the following is not included in the field use EIQ. Application rate, no, it's used in the field EIQ. Toxicity, it's used. C, application timing. That is the correct answer because application timing is not used in field EIQ. So kudos to everyone who got it right. Congrats. You're back on, Carl. All right, so I got the screen, I'm good to go here. All right. Um, so I, I would be remiss as a uh, as a somewhat of a protege of, of Jennifer Grant in the IPM office if I didn't have the IPM triangle up here somewhere in the presentation. Uh, I, I know today we're talking about the EIQ, which which deals, of course, with pesticide use. Um, but we we do have to remember in, in the IPM system uh, when we think about elements, we're always trying to avoid chemical intervention whenever we can, right? And so we have this um, this increasing level of risk as we move up right this this pyramid our cultural physical and biological practices that we have at our disposal are always going to be lower risk than a chemical application um, so it's always important when you identify a pest consider all these options before you get to to the chemical um, option even though if you're selecting lower eiq products that's great we always prefer um, investigating all these other um, options before you get to that point um, so, but when you do, right, you're going to get a pest. Uh, there's obviously going to be a lot of situations where you can't control it unless you have um, pesticides. I, I think there's three important things in my mind um, that should go into that decision-making process. Of course, efficacy does the pesticide work, right? That's that's probably number one, or or one B with cost. These two are the big ones, right? It's got to work, and it's got to be within your price range. Those are the two problems big ones. Um, but where the EIQ comes in is, is there's going to be a lot of situations where you've got multiple products, similar price points that are all can kind of work for you. Um, then then which one do I choose? 
Um, and that's when the EIQ comes in. I think that's when we can say, um, okay, I got a good product. I got a, three good products. Let me go to the EIQ. Which one's lower EIQ? Um, and, and that's where I think the EIQ comes in. How do you figure out which is the most efficacious of the products? Which one's going to work the best? Yeah, that, that's a great point, and it leads me right into the demonstration portion of, uh, of today's uh, little seminar here. Um, Mike, you can see my screen, hopefully, with the browser yeah, set up. We're good. Yes, we can see the we're screen good. with the browser. There. Perfect. So that first point, uh, Mike's asking about efficacy. How do I know what works and what doesn't work? Um, this is an excellent website that has aggregated a bunch of research data um, that turfgrass scientists have done. I'm sure you guys have seen the, uh, you probably had, you know, Murphy on recently and Rich Buckley who talk about uh, trials, right? They spray a bunch of plots, what works, what doesn't work. Well, there's data that comes out of that. And unless you look at all the, the individual presentations and the papers, okay, you gotta go scouring for data. Well, some really smart people in the Wisconsin Turfgrass Association at UW-Madison, they said, why don't we put all that data in, in one place? Um, and so this is what it's called, turfpest.wisc.edu. It's a short little URL if you guys wanna write that down. Um, but basically what you can do is you can go in and you can say, hey, I've got a pest. Uh, so today we'll just we'll, we'll do turf weeds as an example, and we'll choose uh, good old crabgrass. So you can go in, you can select the weed you're interested in. Hey, I wanna control this. And it's gonna spin out a table of products. And there's some information in here. It's got the just a general product name. Um, and then it's got a rating. So if we scroll, we've got a lot of things that are fours. There are some that are threes, twos, ones. And so what this is saying is, okay, anything that's got a fours, it's got really good control um, in, in testing done at, at mostly um, at universities. Anything that's got a three, okay, it's, it's good control, not as good as a four. And as we keep going down here, we get diminishing ret returns and, and how good the control that product is towards this specific pest. So if you're interested in only crabgrass, this is something you can look at and say, hey, okay, I've got some options here. Um, so if we just look at two kind of common ones, pendulum, which has pendimethalin as the active ingredient, and dimension are two um, that are relatively common. So okay, I've gone in, I said, hey, I've got these two products. And, and I personally don't know really the costs of each of these products, but um, let's say they're similar-ish, and, and then I want to choose one, or even if one's more expensive than the other one, okay, now I want to know, is, is one product uh, less risky or more risky than the other one? So now we've got our efficacy data, let's go into the EIQ calculator. So this is what the screen looks like. If you want to just search it in your browser, you can just do this, EIQ oh, yeah. calculator, and it's this first link. Yeah, so well, we'll, do, the Carl, we'll do tomorrow, Carl. We will email everyone out who's an attendee a link to both of these web pages. That Perfect. way, you don't have to research or find. We're going to send you directly to it. Thank yeah. you. And, and these are, these are, uh, you, you know, I use these a lot of times when I'm looking at products, and I use this this Turf Best website a bunch. Uh, and then, of course, there's the EIQ calculator website. So remember those formulas, those equations we talked about earlier, how to calculate field use EIQ. Well, you don't really have to know any of that because you can just use this screen. Uh, and I'm just going to go through really quick and uh, just do a demo. Okay, so that pendulum product, which has pendimethalin, okay, we're going to select the active ingredient. And you'll notice there's a lot of active ingredients here. Um, now, sometimes you may not find your active ingredient. Um, and sometimes that could be because this is maintained by the New York State FPM office. Uh, we focus on products that are labeled in New York. Uh, which is generally uh, not um, many, uh, <laughs> not many, not the same product labeled everywhere else, right? We've got a kind of a <laughs> we're we're not even giving out New York pesticide credits tonight. I can't believe that, but um, yeah, so yeah, so there's yeah, a couple of reasons. <laughs> there's now, uh, so Carl, you may before, not... Carl, before you go um, any farther, though, it's important just to remind everybody that they have to have the active ingredient. They can't go mm -hmm. by the trade name of the product. Correct. And the calculator Correct. So, is set up by the active ingredients. Yeah, and and so tonight, I, you know, I don't have the labels pulled up because that might be a little messy, but basically I've gone into the labels and for that pendulum product, so this product right here, um, I went in the label, it says pendimethalin, the active ingredient, 37.4. 
percent active ingredient, and then the low rate is 3.6 pints per acre. So the nice thing originally, I was talking about how this is usually a pound per acre sort of deal, but if you've got weird units, we've got all your weird units here. Um, so you can just click submit, and then boom, this is what it takes you to. So it tells you, okay, here's what you put in. Here's the EIQ. So remember, that's that first number that we talked about with the big formula. And then here's the field use EIQ. So this is the one we're looking at for the product considering its application rate, its formulation, 40.6. So that's kind of medium-ish. Um, okay, so we know this is... Yep. Carl, on those results, um, you're noticing the field I e the field use number is what we're concerned about, but it's also giving you the individual component numbers mm -hmm. of that. Correct, too, and that's something I think um, that people once they get more comfortable, they start looking at these things a little bit more uh, closely. Um, and so, what you'll generally notice is the ecological component is always higher. Uh, that generally makes makes a lot of sense. Um, and it, so if you're worried maybe more about if a homeowner is concerned about a product and if their dog's out there in the yard or if their kids are out there playing, you might look at only this middle number. Maybe that's the only one that matters. Um, maybe a homeowner is just concerned mostly about the environment. You only focus on this number. Um, so you can choose to do those things. Um, but generally, I like to start with, with the one number. But those are available for people who like to get really uh, nitty gritty into things. Um, so at any rate, this is this is a pendulum, pendomethylin. So remember that number 40. We're going to go back and we're going to put in the active ingredient in dimension, which is diethiopyr. And if you can sort through here, ba, 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 boom. Uh, and that has 24% active ingredient, so a little bit less, and one pint per acre. So you'll notice that's, and this is a low rate again, but uh, so we're kind of remembering, okay, there's lower rates there spits out our information. So diethylpyr is actually lower EIQ than pendomethylin just to start, and it's used at a lower use rate, so 3.8, that's really low. Um, so this is just an example of how you might go through, I've got a pest, what is it? What works for that pest? And then, okay, I've got a couple options, which one is lower EIQ? Uh, and in this case, it would be a dimension. If you're just looking for, for a crabgrass control, um, this might be a product you're you're interested in using. So um, that's just kind of the, the general, um, I think, flow of, of events that I would love to see people um, when they're purchasing products or deciding what to use, um, how they might go about that. I, I did put some resources on here. There's some other ones. Um, this free, uh, this is really for probably more for golf guys who use a lot of fungicides. That's the publication there. Uh, and the Purdue uh, Weed Control for Turfgrass Professionals. Um, all that data is actually in this free website, which is great, um, but it's still, it's got a lot of good visuals, a lot of good information there if you guys are interested in that um, as a resource to have handy. And then, of course, the EIQ, and, and it sounds like uh, Mike is going to send um, those those two links out to you guys so you guys have well, them. What, what I, I'll do, Carl, if you could do me a favor, email me the other links as well. Let's give Perfect. them all the information. Yeah, just send sure. a slide and send that whole slide out, Mike. Yep, so Perfect. Here, hey, Ladies and gentlemen, we are up to quiz number three, and you guys are, are just blowing me away with how smart you are. And obviously, that's a reflection on you, Carl, being an amazing teacher. So let's launch quiz number, I am holding up four fingers, three. <laughs> you, got, you got a minute. Go get it. Only three options on this one. We took it easy here. <laughs> We're still uh, keeping everybody around, Mike. That sounds good. Yeah, yeah and we're keeping everywhere. And most importantly, Carl, I am at a hundred percent so far. That's great. Didn't right. Hear that. Now, mind you, I entered all the questions into the quiz log, so I, I have some advantages. <laughs> But, oh, you personally, you're at 100%. Well, I hope so. <laughs> so uh, we're at uh, 47 seconds, and guess what? We're at 86% uh, submittal, which seems to be our average. So let's close this up, and let's do a quick review. Average score of 88%. Carl, you're an amazing instructor. 
Uh, so when, when I notice a pest, I should first see, investigate cultural, physical, and biological methods of control before considering pesticides. And that was the correct answer. And by the way, congratulations. Woo -woo, Adam Bloods is now working. Congratulations, Adam. You can take quizzes. Carl, go. All right. Keep it moving here. Looks like we're doing good on the quizzes. Um, so, okay, we've covered kind of the basics I wanted to cover on, um, you know, what the EIQ is, what it considers, and then, of course, how to use it online. So now it's time to get to the practical stuff, right? And so we've already we've already seen how the EIQ is something uh, product to product. The field use EIQ, FUEIQ, is really good for that. Um, but you can also use the EIQ in another form um, to look at annual pesticide programs. So let's say uh, a sample lawn program. I work with golf courses a lot. So on golf courses, they may look at their greens or tees or fairways separately. And they might keep all that data. You got to submit your pesticide records every year. You can go back and you can look at the last five years. What was my pesticide risk like? Was it lower? Was it higher? Why might be that case? And you can track the improvements or, or your numbers over the years. And you can figure out, okay, what, what's making my numbers go up? Why are they going down? Um, and so the basic formula here is you take the field use EIQ for whatever application you're making and just multiply it by the number of acres you applied it to. Um, whether that's a golf course fairway of 20 acres or a 5,000 square foot backyard or something. Um, so you can get a number for that EIQ units and then that's all additive. So you can add all these applications together. Um, you can add an applicant pre-emergent application you made early in the year to a uh, another application, another post-emergent application you make later in the year, right? So you can just kind of add these things up and it can give you an overall number. So so how have we seen that done? How have I personally seen that done? Uh, oh, before we get to that, an example. We'll go back to our my, my made up uh, active ingredients here. So just as an example, fabricatazine, let's say I'm only going to apply it to two acres. So I multiply my FUEIQ by two, 48. And pretendazone, remember it's a lower FUEIQ. You know, let's say I'm going to put it on a couple different properties, four acres. My EIQ units would be only be 30. So in, in that case, again, even considering exposure and that we're applying the pretendazone to twice the amount of area, it's still a lower EIQ. And therefore that application, even though it was made to a, a greater amount of land, is, is lower risk, which we like. Um, so how would we use this in real life? Um, I've been fortunate enough to uh, work again with Jennifer Grant and Frank Rossi um, on this New York State Park Golf Course program. Uh, so the goal of this program was to have New York State IBM office, our Cornell Turfgrass program, and the New York State Parks Department come together and, and figure out ways to reduce pesticide risk on state park golf courses. So um, in New York, we've got 27 state park golf courses. About 15 participate really closely with us in this program. It's it's one of the main parts of my job. I get to talk to these uh, superintendents of the golf courses all the time. Uh, we've uh, now gone probably, it's been about, I think it's a decade this year of this project. So working with all these superintendents for a long time um, on pesticide risk and the EIQ. So they're well-versed in it now. Um, hey, Carl, how did it start? Can, I ask you, can I ask you to name drop one of the courses <laughs> in your, what I'm talking about? We, we can, yeah, we can name, so of course, uh, Beth Page State Park, right? Okay. One of the more famous New York State Park golf courses. So the whole park, including the black course, um, is uh, our active participants in that. In fact, they've driven the, pro the program when Frank Rossi and Jennifer Grant started their research with the EIQ back in the early 2000s when uh, the state governor was going to say no pesticides on state park land at all, including golf courses. Um, they got in touch with Jennifer and Frank and said, hey, what does a no pesticide program look like? So they started actually at Bethpage Green, uh, the Bethpage Green course, and they tried six holes with no pesticides, six holes with a low EIQ program and six holes with a normal EIQ program. Um, and unsurprisingly, no pesticides on golf course greens doesn't turn out so good. <laughs> but uh, a low EIQ program turns out just as good as, as a normal conventional program. Um, and so that's what really sparked this, this program starting in, in 2010. 
um, with Carl, all of the state golf courses. Carl, I want to ask, interject one question here. Just because mm -hmm. you end up with a low EIQ, it does not mean that you necessarily are making less applications. Mm -hmm. It's you're Correct. making wiser applications. Yeah, it, it's, it's a more informed way of looking at pesticide Correct. use uh, or pesticide risk. And again, that's the difference between use and risk. Um, we can see more applications, the number of applications go up, and we can see pesticide risk go down. Um, so that's an important note if, if you're choosing products correctly. Um, and also, it, it also doesn't mean lower EIQ does not mean lower efficacy. So we just kind of saw that right with my example of crabgrass, two efficacious products, one is lower EIQ than the other one. Um, so, and, and based on some of the, the research I've done with a bunch of different fungicide products, it doesn't quite track that high EIQ products are more efficacious and low ones are less efficacious. Uh, there, there really isn't a whole lot of correlation there, so that's why it's important to say that that low EIQ does not mean low efficacy. Uh, it just means less risk. So, um, Carl, can I take a quick swing at summing this up? Basically, what you just said is you want to take everyone on this webinar out golfing at Beth Page. On you, is that Mike, that you Mike, the, the course we would play at Beth Page, you have to walk. There are no carts. So uh, I'm not sure. Probably not going to work well. Not going to work well. Not. Yeah, we, we well. I'll tell you this much: the PGA Championship last year, 2019, they made an exception for John Daly. Uh, he had an injury exception to ride a cart. Yeah, and as well, much as the New Yorkers love John Daly, that was not received well. Right. And the anybody. injury to John Daly was <laughs> goes back to your original presentation: too much gin and tonics. <laughs> so maybe a, maybe a couple too many G and Ts for yeah, uh, for big too John many there. G and Ts to, to you know. <laughs> so, so, uh, but, but a good point by Mike uh, overall, Mike, about the um, that this this uh, EIQ system is used by high end golf courses, Beth Page Black, during PGA Championships. Uh, PGA Tour playoff events. Montauk Downs is a beautiful golf course out in the East End. Charlie's got a great golf course out there that barely anybody can get to. Another championship quality golf course that looks at EIQ. So um, something that's used at high-end properties. Um, okay, so I think that's that's worth mentioning, certainly. But um, so, so, you know, okay. So, uh, you know, Frank and Jennifer are really happy to get uh, into this, this uh, program, talking about EIQ with all the State Park golf courses. And First three years, it's, it's not going so well. We see numbers go straight up, um, and it's a statewide average, statewide medium too. So, this is uh, this again is about 15 golf courses going into this data set. Why was this the case? Why that first couple of years we see an increase? Um, well, well, pretty standard operation, IPM operation, is to talk about scouting and to talk about properly identifying your pest, keeping records, going out and looking at pests developing pest thresholds, and, and what ended up happening is a lot of the superintendents started learning more about, okay, this is this is how I properly identify certain diseases, certain insects, and when you first learn to how to identify those things, then you start noticing them all over the place. <laughs> so what we saw was people were more in tune to their pest problems, and then they thought they had more pest problems, so they, they apply more pesticides, and that's generally why that trend went up over the first couple of years. Um, more applications of about the same products, we saw an increase in risk. Um, so the first couple of years was was really training people on the basics of IPM, uh, and we didn't. This is the first time we really looked at EIQ on a large scale with a bunch of data, a bunch of different golf courses, a lot of applications. And so when Jennifer and, and Frank and, and Bob Portmus, um, who was influential on this project, when they looked at all that data the first couple of years. They said, boy, a lot of the risk, you know, almost more than half of that EIQ number is coming from two pests. It's coming from dollar spot, which is a very common, the most common disease pest we have in, in New York on golf courses, and annual bluegrass weevil, ABW. So, man, okay, we got a lot of risk coming from these two. Maybe we should focus on those two. Um, and so what we did is, is what Jennifer and Bob and and Frank did is they focused on first of all the large areas. So when you're making an application to 20 acres. Um, how you choose your product matters a lot. You can reduce your total EIQ a ton by just choosing a softer product. That's what we call product swapping there. Um, take one jug, sub it out for this jug, and that automatically uh, over 20 acres, over 30 acres of application, that adds up, and that's a really easy way to reduce EIQ. 
Uh, in fact, uh, I, I've been advocating for the state park system to um, invest in GPS sprayers because it, it's pretty common to see a 15 to 25 percent reduction in area treated just because you got a GPS system, no overlap, no spraying into the rough areas when you're only trying to treat the fairways. Because without even changing your product selection, you're going to reduce the number of acres treated, and that's also important. Um, but anyway, product swapping is important. Spot treating kind of on that GPS sprayer uh, thought process is, is something, again, if, if you're treating 28 acres of fairways, but let's say only 10 of the acres really have that pest issue, spot treating cuts your risk in half without doing anything else. Um, a really good example in our state park program was, was um, spot treating fairway applications for annual bluegrass weevil, so ABW. Basically what happens is these insects overwinter in the long grass areas off on the sides of the golf course. As things warm up in the spring, they kind of move in and they move in to get to the POA and the fairways. And if you time it right and you and you scouting, you're doing your soap flushes, your salt flushes, and you're seeing those insects getting right to the edge of the fairway at a certain point, you can go out and make an application and just do a loop around the fairway because they haven't made it into the middle of the fairway yet. There's no sense in the spring treating the middle of the fairway when the, when the insects aren't there. Instead of treating the entire fairway, they do a loop around the fairway, which cut their uh, acreage by, you know, 70 percent while still getting really good control, treating where only the pesticides are spot treating. Uh, and then, of course, eliminating applications is, is, a, is a good way to reduce EIQ. And that's something we advocate for. But of course, that's a hard thing for people to do. Right. It's, it's hard to not spray. Um, and one of the ways we've gotten people to do that is by looking at pesticide at, at Pest pressure models, so dollar spot, there's a bunch of models that can predict when dollar spot is going to get bad or when it's not going to get bad. And a lot of times when they come up, when they schedule their applications, usually every two weeks is, is kind of how the schedule goes for green surfaces. At the end of the two weeks, we say, hey, look at the, the, the pest pressure model. What do the next five days look like? If it looks like there's not going to be dollar spot the next five days, why don't you extend that interval a little bit? And so every time you can do that, you can kind of do that enough during the season to overall, hopefully, make maybe one or two fewer applications. So these are all the things we focused on with our state park golf courses. So we go from 2013 uh, and then working on all of those uh, IPM principles, we've been able to reduce EIQ numbers uh, almost 40 percent now. And, and uh, we're really happy with, with how people are. Uh, using the EIQ and how are they using principles to reduce their EIQ. Um, so we've seen a lot of success there. And again, this is a bunch of different golf courses, very high end included there. Um, also some some just uh, normal golf courses too. So a bunch of different ability levels. A lot of people were, were able to grasp this concept and, and really um, to reduce their pesticide risk with it, which is something we love to see. So, so, um, so question for you, Carl. Did, mm -hmm. Them switching out the lower EIQ product, did it diminish the quality or playability of those courses? Uh, it did not. And and uh, if you if you watch the PGA Championship last spring, um, and as somebody who was out there taking measurements in the morning, uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I, I can tell you that <laughs> there's no, no drop off in uh, playing quality of the Beth Page Black course. And actually, um, their trends mirror this blue line very closely, right? So, um, again, 2019, one of their lowest years ever of, of EIQ use, uh, and they hosted a major a major golf championship. So, you know, it's another good point, Mike, that, um, again, lower EIQ does not necessarily mean worse conditions, playing conditions on golf-wise, and it's not going to mean worse conditions for, for your uh, customers. It's uh, it, it's purely an indication of the the risk of the product, and you can really separate it. Can separate out from the efficacy, and, and that's why I say, you know, don't go EIQ first. Go to efficacy first. Go to cost first, and then the EIQ is that last decision making thing that you can use to reduce um, to reduce your pesticide risk. Um, so just a quick summary here. Um, you know, step one, and then I like to think of this as steps. I don't want to think that anybody's going to go full hog and and get right into the EIQ tomorrow morning, right? And I and I think that's that's natural. You got to kind of dip your toe in the water, right? So the first way to dip your toe in the water, step one, just go to that EIQ calculator and and whatever products you use, just kind of go through and and go through the process. What rates you can put in your high rate, your low rate, see what the difference in your field use EIQ number is going to be. 
I can jot those down. I think that's a good first step. Um, the second step is to then, okay, let's let's look at alternatives. What other products are out there that might be the same efficacy? And then compare. And you can, again, use that EIQ calculator. And then the third step is one Carl, where, okay, this, yep. Carl, does the, does the calculator, a lot of times people are on tank mix combinations. So the EIQ sure. comes out with a, this is this product, this is the second product, this is the third. Does a calculator then can also work in a tank mix combination? So the way you have to use the calculator for a tank mix, say you've got, um, let's say, two or three active ingredients in there, um, you're going to have to go through for each active ingredient, you're going to have to do the calculator. So if you've got a three-way herbicide, you'll go in and you'll take the first active ingredient, you'll find that one, you'll put in what percentage uh, is in the formulation there and the rate of the product. So you'll get that field UCIQ. And then what you do is you'll add, you go to the second active ingredient, put all the information there. You'll add all those field use EIQs up to get the, the field use, the FUEIQ for the whole product. Um, gotcha. Okay. So, so it takes a little bit of time. Uh, and this is actually one of the things we'd like to, uh, we're, we're trying to get some grant money to improve the EIQ calculator. And that's one of the functions we'd like to have in there is if you have a couple active ingredients. Can you select all those? But if you're just using the calculator, that's something you got to do. You know, you just got to go in and, and, and okay. make sure each active ingredient is accounted for. Perfect. Um, and then, uh, and so that actually gets to step three. So this is, you know, when, when people get comfortable using the EIQ calculator, step three might be, okay, I'm going to go and calculate all my EIQ units. Um, that's not something the calculator set up to do, but uh, I've made a spreadsheet. That I, that I gave, again, our state park superintendents use this spreadsheet um, to calculate their yearly EIQ, right? These guys are applying every two weeks on greens, every three weeks on fairways, rough sprays, tea sprays. Um, so this is set up to kind of um, automatically calculate EIQ based on some information you've put in. So if you're really interested in your yearly, maybe a program or, or how much uh, risk your, your entire company uses in a given year, um, just just send me an email, css223 at cornell.edu. I'll send you this spreadsheet. I can walk you through how to use it. It's, it's pretty simple, though. Um, but it's got everything embedded in there. It's got all the EIQ values embedded. All you got to do, is same as the calculator, just throw some information in there about the active ingredient, percent active uh, ingredient and, and application rate, how many acres, and it'll spit out a bunch of things. There's a summary page that can tell you total uh, for the year. So this is a way... Um, I'd love to get this up on, on the website. There's some permission issues that are tough to get uh, when you're putting an Excel spreadsheet on the Cornell uh, website, but um, just, just send me an email. I'd be more than happy to, to send you this EIQ spreadsheet if you want to get started, and of course, would, would help you through that. Uh, so hey, those- Carl, uh, Carl, yeah. Carl enough, nothing. You and I, we've been chatting about this for like four months. You've been holding out on me. You never showed me I, this before. I, What's oh up come with, on! I, I said you had you could you could use the EIQ spreadsheet. No, no, you never sent it. You're holding out. Oh, on. I thought you had. I thought you had this to me, Lou. I don't want to talk to you anymore. Mike, <laughs> Mike, you have to be able to understand. You have to stay for the whole program. You can't depart is, halfway through. Is that through. what it is? Oh, I didn't know. I didn't know that. All right, so much quiz number four, folks. Here it goes. You got. I'm going to give you 37 seconds. Go. So, so this is the final one, Mike, and, and, and I don't have anything else, Mike. So while people are taking the quiz, um, also think about any questions you've got at the end here. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of this, I think there's a lot of good questions that can, that can be out there. So I'm more than happy to uh, chat with anybody who's, who's uh, got some more questions here. No yeah, problem. And, Appreciate it. And, and we've got some on the chat there, Mike, too, coming in. So. Yeah, I, I, I saw that, and so we'll get to those. We're, we're at seventy-six percent completion, and we're at thirty-eight seconds. I, I, I'm good, and you give a little more time, folks, but not much. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two. One, you're done. <laughs> so um, I want to review it real quick to see how amazing. Oh, my gosh, Carl, 
you're only getting better with time. 94 oh, nice. average score. And so the question was, the EIQ can be used for the following except, and the answer was C, compare fertilizer products. Ding, 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 ding. Congratulations. Oh, my gosh. I just realized when I put the test in, I think I put incorrect answers on uh, in parentheses. That, that could be a problem. Oh, well, <laughs> I'm good. I'm not really caring about it too much, too, too much. So I, Carl, if you could do me a favor, you could kick back control of the screen to me. Perfect. As, as you realize, I am a control freak. <laughs> so let me, NJTA host Mike, correct? That's it. All right. right, hopefully right now you guys should see my second screen and I'm looking at my slave one behind me. So yes, I can see that right now. And so that's pretty awesome. So uh, before we, uh, we open it up to questions and answers, I need to stress again that it's important that you email a picture of you holding your driver's license to exec director at New Jersey or njturfgrass.org. And notice I, in the meanwhile, I changed over to reflect the proper date, 12 10 2020 class. You got to do it. If you don't do it, you will not be receiving the CEUs. And by the way, there was a boatload of CEUs for this class. So congratulations, Carl. So far, you are winning the race with CEUs, except in your own home state of yes. New York. Yes, that, that's inexcusable. What are you going to do? At least I'm beating Buckley in CEUs. I'm going to give him crap for that. You 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 spanked them bad. Just I'm just saying that. So open competition. So, hey, here's another thing. A little bit of self promoting. Um, we're looking for people to join New Jersey Turf Grass Association committees. Um, we we have a need for people on our field day committee, our social media committee, our finance committee. All of these things. We're looking for people that can help us. Um, the the Turf Grass Association. All the board members and all the committee members, they're volunteers. And it's its a fast growing and dynamic association, but we need help. So if, if you're interested in being part of the virtual learning committee, we've got one. So if there's something that interests you, something that you're going, hey, maybe I want to do it, well, then contact CC at the email address, or you can just give her a call, or if you want to stay around to the end of the presentation and chat about it perfectly fine we'd love to talk about it and, and so right now before we open it up to questions again i want to thank the sponsors for their support without them this doesn't happen so with with that said thank you sponsors once again and now what we're going to do is let's open it up to questions shall so, we yep one of the questions we have here um is does the location of the factors within the formula determine the importance of that particular factor? So we talked about you had the worker, the environment, and you know the the the, the customer. Is there that formula it doesn't it isn't heavy towards one or the other? From what I gathered, you were saying it's pretty evenly distributed. Uh, so you will typically see numbers greater in the ecological component, um, and that's because there's more terms in there. There's going to be higher numbers generally. So when you're evening out the three, the ecological is usually going to be the highest one. Um, so you will get uh, probably most 60 to 70 percent of the field use EIQ or the excuse me, the base EIQ is going to be determined by that ecological component, which which makes sense. Right. You're you're. The people in these models are trying to consider a lot of environmental components. A lot of that data relates to organisms and how that pesticide might reach organisms. So the ecological term will always be higher and, and usually uh, is, is kind of the higher weighted uh, term in the equation. Okay. Um, we have a, a question here, and it's a rather long one, but I'm going to read it. Um, it says, and this is from. Uh, Shannon. Ah, Shannon, how you doing? I'm working with a group from Australia for a new uh, registrant candidate for soil fumigation. Uh, we're starting U.S. 
efficacy trials in the upcoming years for sod production. One of the benefits is a higher absorption potential by the organics. Does your model take into account potential organic absorption in hazard in the hazard aspects of anything that has persistence in the soil, for example? Yeah, so this this is a good question, and I think it speaks to some of the limitations, right? So I think what you're saying, Shannon, is it's going to absorb very readily to the soil, right? It's not going to get out. And I think with fumigants, you're probably worried about it getting into the air, right? Air quality. Um, and, and certainly our model does not take into account anything uh, with the product volatilizing, getting into the air or, and moving that way, drift. Um, so that is one of the limitations of the model. It's not, con it's not going to consider that it actually might be good sometimes for a fumigant to hang on to the soil, not get into the air. Um, so that's, that's, uh, so short answer to the question is no, it doesn't consider um, air quality hazards. And that's one of the limitations. And that's, you know, when you get into modeling and, and some of these, one, uh, some of these models are, are very complex, pages and pages of equations. And that gives you a little bit better way to maybe estimate some of these things but then you lose the ability to do this really quick and easy and to get one number um so yeah that's that's uh, not accounted for in the equation um and and one of the limitations which is uh you know it's just just uh, kind of how it is when you're getting to a single number and something that's easy to interpret um from a manufacturing standpoint and, and i mean this eiq is i think pretty important in our overall business, whether it's golf, whether you're in lawn care, uh, wherever. Are the manufacturers looking at this and perhaps contemplating putting the EIQs on their labels? You know, so we have talked to some manufacturers about it, uh, the EIQ. Uh, I'm not going to say who, but... Um, there have been people that have gotten in touch with us just to learn more about it, what it's like. Um, they weren't looking at it from a labeling perspective. They were looking at it from uh, probably more of a marketing perspective, uh, to be completely honest, um, which is fine. Uh, I think the labeling of, of maybe EIQ on a label, there's probably legalities on what can be on a label. These things are 15 pages long, so I'm sure you could sneak it in there somewhere. Um, so I, I don't, I haven't heard of about people putting it on the label, but I, individual salesmen I've talked to have started learning more about it. And I think it's something um, they're gonna at least consider when, when they're trying to maybe sell their products. I, again, I deal a lot with superintendents. Um, it's something that's becoming a little bit more um, visible, a little bit more mainstream to say. And, and I think it's useful for manufacturers to maybe look at the EIQ of their products and, and, uh, and start using that as, as something to, to talk about. I don't see any more questions, Mike. Um, well, actually, I, I see I see two. But this one uh, came out. It says, do the lower use rates of the newer chemistries coming out also improve EIQ? That, that's a really good question. And you're, Andrew, that's a good observation. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of you have made that observation. There's lower use rates, a lot of these new chemistries. You know, I, I've seen you know, four or five, six percent active ingredient, low, low application rates. Uh, the, and that's going to drop EIQ. It's definitely going to drop EIQ. Um, generally, newer products have been lower EIQ because of that, uh, lower field use EIQ. Um, a lot of them do have kind of higher base EIQ values, but again, that exposure element is weighted very heavily uh, in the EIQ model. So, so generally, yeah, newer chemistries do have EIQ. I will mention um, if you if you use a lot of new chemistries, again, the New York State IPM office. Uh, they need to get a lot of this data to, to produce a number, and sometimes for newer chemistries, a lot of that data, data isn't publicly available yet. So you may not find the EIQ for, for a new product up on the EIQ database. Um, but just a heads up uh, if, if, if you run into that issue already, maybe. And, and, from and the other time, thing, you the other thing, chemistries, and so right now, if you look up Quinclorac, it's not up on your page because they're updating mm -hmm. the EIQ score. Is that correct? Yeah, and, and that's probably a revision. Um, so they, they go in and review old chemistry. So, and that's because new data becomes available. So sometimes they review a product six, seven years ago, and then they say, oh, new information from this source or that source. Let me review it. So uh, it, it, yeah, it's probably just a review process. And 
Um, you know, you know, one of the issues, so many pesticide active ingredients, you could go through that list. It's like 400 in there. It's, you know, a bunch, most of them I've never heard of because only a fraction are used in turf. So, um, but yeah, you may not and, find all of them in there. And once again, the product may not be listed even though it's been around for a while simply because it's not registered in New York. So take yeah. that into account too, folks. Of course, New mm -hmm. York didn't get us credit for tonight either. So, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I got one more question here. It, 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 I'm not gonna name the person. It just said, is that is that cutie patootie Matt Lindner married or single? I don't know what that is. Mike, you couldn't, you can't <laughs> type that question yourself. <laughs> Well, look, we want to thank everyone for attending. And more importantly, we want to thank Carl. Uh, he's done a fantastic job. As Mike said earlier, we'll, we'll em he's going to email out to you tomorrow the websites um, and Carl's email address. Uh, if, we, if you want to get that calculator um, for to use, uh, Mike, we should include that on the, um, on the email, please. And more importantly, folks, support the sponsors of this and even more important than that if you are not a member of njgic now's the time to sign up um you know it's it, we do this this was brought to you by these sponsors it went out to memberships and also non-members so you know that's what we want we want to get our name out there we want to support the industry and we want to bring uh the newest technology available to you folks so we appreciate your support and hope everyone has a fantastic evening and a good upcoming holiday. And so and so a quick closing, uh, to see a list of our upcoming webinars and events, please visit our website at www.newjersey or njturfgrass.org. You know, Carl, thanks. Matt, really appreciate you uh, helping uh, carry the load on this. Um, again, if someone is interested in joining a committee, I'm going to stay on the webinar so we can have a brief conversation. If if you'd rather just do something and, and call CC, that's also an opportunity. And if you're not a member of the New Jersey Turfgrass Association, we'd really love to welcome you with open arms.